Dear fr friends and Christians, you are welcome to our ECC farewell legacy prayer in our hearts. And I'm Elder Dr. Prosper Tetedo. And this is in memory of 25 years of distinguished devoted service by our pastor, Richard Buxton, senior minister, and his wife, Pastor Rajinda Buxton of the Ealing Christian Center, United Kingdom. And these are the summary of the topics we'll be praying for. And I invite you to pray along with me. They are revelations for ECC prayer and fasting month, February, 2022, led by the Holy Spirit as a main prayer topic for theme for February 2022, which are broken down as follows. Acts chapter 18, verses one to four, persuading others. Acts chapter 18, verses five to six, discharging our responsibilities to all. Acts chapter 18, verses seven to eight, many believed. Acts chapter 18, verses nine to 11, do not be silent. Acts chapter 18, verses 12 to 17, enemies in confusion. We continue. Acts chapter 18, verse 23, strengthening the disciples. And we continue with all these verses as in Acts, through or thorough in knowledge of the scriptures, instructing one another, baptism in the Holy Spirit persistence in sharing the good news, extraordinary miracles, overcoming evil spirits, the fear of the Lord, repentance, strong in the face of opposition, wisdom when to remain silent, false religions, peace making, encouraging one another, teamwork, communion, raising the dead, humility and tears, no hesitation to preach, ready to face hardship for Christ, wolves among the flock, tears, and finally, but not the least, more blessed to give than to receive. So we go now to start and just join me even during this time on revelations for ECC prayer and fasting month, February, 2022, coming from the prayer ministry of one of the intercessors. The word I'm about to share has been revealed to me over a period of time since October, 2021. And I feel impressed on my heart that God is more than ready to manifest revival on the earth, but the church is just not ready. He is not a mean God that he's ignoring the prayers of his saints, but we need to humble ourselves and allow him to be God in our lives individually and in our meetings corporately. Put our agendas aside and let him take over. I stumbled on a sermon which made me feel like God was saying, if you don't get this, you will never get it. The speaker was talking about God doing a new thing, which unfortunately can often times get missed because it wouldn't necessarily take the form of what we expect. The heart of this message, if dying to self and humbling ourselves, if we want to see the move of God on a micro and macro level, Below is an excerpt of the sermon, which I thought we could all benefit from in our preparation to kill the killer self. Firstly, it is challenging when God is doing a new thing. New means unfamiliar. Next, new means a death to the now. New means we haven't been there. Thirdly, new means it's probably not going to look like what 
you think it's going to look like. Fourthly, new means new, but oftentimes when the new comes, we miss it because we think we know what the new thing is. Fifthly, new typically means with a death to the now and a death to you in the now so that you can birth himself a fresh way through you and in you. One of my best examples in the Bible is Moses. God told him to strike the rock for the people to get water. Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 to 6, you may read that. Next time God wanted to give the people water, he told Moses to speak to the rock. But Moses used the same old method and struck the rock like before. Numbers chapter 20, verses 1 to 12. And the consequences were dire. Now let's move on to Sunday, 31st of October, 2021, Revelation that was revealed to the intercessor. I woke up as usual around 7 a.m. to prepare for the intercessory prayers. Just moments into my worship, I started weeping until I was bent over by the intensity of my crying, which was rising right from my belly and up. Not sure this makes sense, but it's the only way I can describe the experience. The weeping went on simultaneously with utterances in the spirit, and I sensed by inner interpretation that the utterances were about revival. It was the last topic to have been on mind on a Sunday morning, preparing for intercessory prayers. On reflection, however, I had earlier on in the month taken a break at a place which had experienced the presence of God in an unusual way some decades ago. I had wanted a break in a healthy environment where I could just get refreshed. But whilst there, I found myself crying for revival in my prayers more than any other prayer needs. The cry was continually, Lord, let me take back to my church the revival anointing, fire, and rain that has once been experienced in this place. As I wept, I burst into tongues and different choruses, and this pattern went on for some time until I started singing, Rain, Rain on Me by Noel Robinson. Although I say singing, it didn't feel like I was singing a song. The words were so real. When I sang particularly the words, I hear the sound of revival rain. The words felt so real. I felt like I was seeing something tangible or just making an announcement that re revival was here. The analogy I can think of closest to the experience is like, if you have been waiting for someone and the person finally arrives, then you make an announcement to those that have been waiting that so-and-so is here or has arrived. And the words open up the heavens, pouring out your blessing. Open up the heavens, pouring out your blessing, endlessly flowed out of me, not as a song or prayer, but a statement or affirmation of what is needed for revival to manifest. As I wept, I felt myself crying out, start with me, Lord, start with the intercessors, start with my church. I was at the same time uttering repentance for myself and the group for putting our agendas to the fore whenever we come in God's presence. This went on from 7 a.m. until I joined the prayer line, line. Due to the prolonged crying, when I announced myself, I was asked whether I was okay as my voice didn't sound right and or whether I had a code. When the question was posed, I felt like my response was to just 
burst into the rain song as tears rolled down my face, but I had to constrain myself as it was an unexpected experience. And I wasn't sure how it would be perceived by the group. I instead responded to both questions that I was okay and didn't have a cold. Then I immediately muted as I started crying uncontrollably again throughout the prayer session. This continued as I commuted to church that morning. I was weeping on the bus and on the train and throughout the service and all week. Pause here for dear Christian friend to reflect on what has gone on so far and note some things down. As we move on to the next revelation, Elim Worship Weekend, Friday, the 5th of November, 2021. I attended the event on the above date and throughout the event, utterances were just flowing out of me and it was all about revival and repenting for prioritizing our agendas above God's agenda. It so happened the same song, Rain, was played that night. At this point, I just found myself going on my knees and beginning to intercede and repenting on behalf of the worship team for making worship into a playlist, moving from one song and straight to another without allowing space for the Holy Spirit's move. At some point, I tried to get up and dance, but I felt that I was to remain on the floor interceding for the worship team. And this was the case for the remaining duration of the night. And it was during this time that I received the message that I'll be sharing shortly. Sunday, the 7th of November, 2021. Whilst preparing for the intercessory prayer again this Sunday, I had a repeat of the same experience as the previous Sunday. Only this time, the crying was so intense that I was not successful suppressing it when I joined the line and announced my name. This was coupled with a strong urge to sing the song Rain, as I felt like the Holy Spirit wanted to break out among us that morning. So when another person was called upon to sing a different song, I felt like the Holy Spirit had wanted to interrupt the program at this very point and establish his own agenda as we sang rain. Hence, my spontaneous request to sing the song, but it wasn't meant to be just singing. I had a strong sense and awareness of the presence of the Holy Spirit, like he was ready to do something albeit I didn't know what or how. After this moment, when I was later asked to sing the song, I felt that the Holy Spirit moment had been missed. My initial thought was not to sing, but I felt the need to try and clear the atmosphere for the sake of those on the line. As I was singing, I felt Psalm 137 verses one to four, strongly impressed on my heart. And I sensed that I shouldn't have sung at all because it wasn't meant to be just a song. When I was asked to sing the song a second time, I knew there was no purpose in singing the song. But again, for everyone's sake, I went ahead and sang the song. When I start the story of Elisha, and King Joash in 2 Kings chapter 13, verses 14 to 19, flashed in my mind like a five, a live scene on a screen. And I felt this quiet voice on the inside as King Joash missed the opportunity. Had he done what Elisha expected in verse 19? So had we by holding on to our agenda. If I can interject here, another similar incident is the November half night 
when a sister went on singing after the worship had stopped. It was evident she was not just singing. Hers wasn't the song. She was just blessing the Lord. The way her words were being harmonized was sending chills through the spine. As I listened, I was praying, please, Lord, don't let this moment pass, by, pass us by again. There is no way of knowing what might have happened had she been allowed to continue. This is by no means trying to draw attention to myself, but to set a context for what I'm about to share. Following Sunday the 7th, the Holy Spirit graciously began to open my eyes to his heart regarding the revival that we are so earnestly praying for. And I felt the Lord saying that it's not our prayers or fasting that will usher in revival, but our changed hearts. Much as prayer is as important as the breath in our lungs, with God, prayer and humility, obedience are synonymous, thus inseparable. We can't have one without the other. God is ready to send revival in the land, but it's his people that are not ready. The body of Christ as a whole, or individuals, we are not allowing him. Not that he needs man's permission to be God, to do what he wants to do, when and how, because we always have our own agendas. Refer to Isaiah chapter 58, verses 2 to 3, which says, Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice for the children of Israel to be heard? And their prayers answered, God didn't require of them more fasting or prayers, but change hearts as seen in the rest of the chapter and the blessings received. The message continues. I first received from the Lord a revelation of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, whilst at the National Day of Prayer at the Wembley Arena on 31st August 2019. At some point, there was a call for national repentance for Britain's wrongs against certain nations as such representatives from these nations were called to the platform as the British leaders knelt before these people asking for forgiveness. It was like heavens opened and it felt like the environment around me all of a sudden became brighter that I had noticed. The Holy Spirit then began to speak to me that repentance is unto God and not man, because all sin is against him and not man, as the stories below flashed into my mind. Joseph and Potiphar's wife in Genesis chapter 39, verses 7 to 9. David and Bathsheba's husband, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 12 to 13, and Psalm 51, verses 3 to 4. Ananias and Sapphira, Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 4. During my break, the Holy Spirit shone his light afresh on 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, in a way I had never known the scripture before, despite the numerous times I had read it. If my people who are called by my name, one, will humble themselves, two, and pray three and seek my face four and ten from their wicked ways five then i will hear from heaven six and will forgive their sin seven and will heal their land on this occasion 
I felt the Lord saying, my people skip over stage one, which is humble themselves and get straight to stage two and pray. And then three and seek my face and come there. I've always perceived the verse as requiring being humble as opposed to a demand on an individual to make it happen and not just to be it, if this makes sense. I said, Lord, from Genesis to Revelation, you acknowledge our weakness and limitations, and you promise to help us do or be that what you require of us. How come on the issue of humility, you are asking us to humble ourselves? As soon as I finished my question, I felt these quiet words on the inside because you know what to do. I just heard myself blurting out, we do, how Lord? And as I mulled over these words, these verses flashed through my mind. Micah chapter six, verse eight. He has shown you, oh man, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Emphasis was on, he has shown you, oh man, what is good. That is through his word, which sets out his expectations of us, but we choose to walk in disobedience to his word, just as if the Holy Spirit wanted me to really get it without room for any excuses, the scripture below was also impressed in my mind. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 11 to 20. For this commandment, which I command you today, is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. See, I have said before you today, life and good, death and evil. In that, I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his judgments, that you may live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him. For he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them. Apostle Paul said this of the Lord Jesus, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name in Philippians chapter two, verses eight to nine. It is humbling to know that even our Lord Jesus 
had to humble himself to be exalted. How much more me and you? And the message goes on some other scriptures about humbling ourselves. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse seven, or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted? First Kings chapter 21, verse 29, do you see how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days. Daniel chapter 10, verse 12, on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard and I have come in response to your words. Because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and you have torn your clothes and wept before me, I truly have heard you, declares the Lord. 2 Kings chapter 2, 22, verse 19. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 18, verse 4. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. Matthew 23, verse 12, and Luke 14, verse 11. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. James chapter 4, verse 10. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. First Peter chapter 5, verse 6. The message continues. Until this point in my life, I had been hearing James chapter 4, verse 10 being quoted time and again in a negative way that when the Holy Spirit started speaking to me about humility, fear gripped my heart as I felt that he was revealing something to me that I could not attain and feared appearing in his eyes as rebellious. The more I searched out the scriptures, however, it dawned on me that the command to humble ourselves, each of these scriptures, and with a promise for God to exalt the one who humbles himself. I then began to feel a sense of burning in my heart and a desire to humble myself so I could walk in that effortless exaltation. Message continues. Time and again, I have heard people say, we need to die to self to be used of God. But this is a concept that I have never given regard to. It's never resonated with me because it sounds like an old cliche to me, but the Holy Spirit revealed to me that to humble ourselves, we must die to self. The Holy Spirit allowed me to understand that self, that means killing daily is found in the I statements that are ever constantly on our lips if we are to walk in humility before God. The Lord then brought Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 to mind as he began to show me how Apostle Paul dealt with his eyes in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. For I through the law, died to the law, that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. The message continues. We often make such statements as, this is how or not how I do things. I don't do this or that. I don't get involved. I keep to myself. I don't interfere with this. This is what I want to do, etc., etc. 
The Holy Spirit is saying, we need to die to self daily. Why daily? Because the I statements are part of who we are, the flesh, warring against the spirit and what the word of God says we are. Therefore, we need to keep these aligned with God's word. We need to always ask ourselves where we have the I statement, but what does the word of God say about this situation? Bearing in mind, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. This is what the Holy Spirit has taught me about 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people will humble themselves, if we keep in check our I statements against God's word, we are dying to self daily. And when we die to self, we are humbling ourselves. And when we humble ourselves, we do away with our agendas and walk in humility. And when we walk in humility, we are walking in obedience to God's word. And when we are obedient to God's word, we walk in love, forgiveness, and unity. Timothy said, every part of scripture is God-breathed and useful one way or another, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's way through the word we are to put together and shaped up for the task God has for us. Second Timothy chapter three, verses 16 to 17 from the message Bible. The message continues, walking in love and dealing with the spirit of indifference. Jesus said, this is how everyone will recognize that you are my disciple when they see the love you have for each other. John chapter 13, verse 35. We learned early last year that discipleship is central to ECC vision. Later in the year, on the 18th of July, 2021, God sent us his servant who, helped, who told us what discipleship looks like. We need to connect, not just communicate. Jesus said, for when you saw me hungry, you fed me. When you found me thirsty, you gave me drink. When I had no place to stay, you invited me in. And when I was poorly clothed, you covered me. When I was sick, you tenderly cared for me. And when I was in prison, you visited me. Matthew chapter 25, verse 35 to 36. This scripture is all about closeness and proximity. Jesus didn't say, I was in prison and you prayed for me or what's up me? He said, you visited me. Not too many days ago, I got to learn that due to the shortage of musicians, sometimes our worship team gets backup sound for sound enhancement, which means the worship team are led by the soundtracks in that where the soundtrack ends, the song also ends. I remembered the last time I led the Sunday intercession, I shared with the team that I felt impressed on my heart. We should make it a prayer point to pray into the next service regarding commit to the Holy Spirit. All the leaders leading the following Sunday, pastor, worship leader, and children and youth leaders for grace to wait on him. But little did I know, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. John chapter 12, verse 24. This reminded me of the body of Christ that humbled themselves and put, to self, put self to death in the most profound way and the incredible benefits reaped thereof. If you have not heard of the story behind Matt Redman's song, Heart of Worship, please see the link below and let's 
continue to intercede for our worship leaders. So the link was given. I feel that what the Lord is requiring of us is to die to self before which we wouldn't be able to walk in humility. That is obedience to his word. God and his word are one. I have heard it said, we need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. But scripture says, do not grieve, vex, or quench the Holy Spirit. Let's call it what it is and have a renewed sense of his ever present presence in and around us. For he has shown you, oh man, what is good. Thank you, dear friend, even for this first part, which covers the revelations for ECC prayer and fasting for the month of February, 2022, which is in memory of 25 years service by Pastor Richard Buxton and Pastor Rajinda Buxton of Ealing Christian Center. And we'll continue in the next session with part two of this series. And it's my prayer that you click on the subscribe button so that you receive notification of the next in this series. And God bless you, and may he be gracious unto us. May he send revival unto a church in our land that is obedience, even as we put into practice what the Spirit says, even to the churches. It is not by might, it is not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. God bless you. And may he, he cause his church to move from one degree of glory, even unto another. In Jesus' name, I am Elder Dr. Prosper Tetido of the Ealing Christian Center in the United Kingdom. <laughs>